All right, I, I guess I have to use a microphone, so it's going to tie me a little bit. But this is kind of a laid-back presentation, kind of going through what my path was from Gonzaga as a chemistry student uh, to today, and really giving my experiences. So with that in mind, I just wanted to put a couple caveats out there, um, what this talk is and what it's not about. Um, it is my personal journey and my experiences, uh, so it's kind of the ups and downs that I've kind of gone through, lessons I've learned uh, both from personal stuff as well as through colleagues, uh, but it's definitely not a roadmap for anyone to follow as a, a path that you must go on. Uh, I probably wouldn't even recommend that. Um, it's a lot of my own successes and failures. Uh, this is a lot of learning by mistakes. Uh, but I think one of the best ways that you can do is sharing your mistakes with others so they don't make the same one. Uh, a lot of time in science, um, for the longest time, it was very big silos where no one wanted to share mistakes because it felt that they gave them a leg up. Uh, but here, really, I think sharing your mistakes and failures can help accelerate things, both in the science as well as the business world. And it's not encouraging you to go one way or the other or discouraging you. Uh, you know, I'm Switzerland on this. I think everyone can make their own choices, but you need to have the information to make those choices uh, to push you one way or the other. A lot of times when potential founders or grad students or professors come to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about starting a company in biotech, the first thing out of my mouth is always, don't do it. It's a horrible job. And then <laughs> that calls about 70% of the people. And then they go, I'll think, I thought about that, but I really do. And I say, okay, let's come here and let's talk about it. So, I mean, it, it really is not supposed to be encouraging one way or discouraging you from it, but really just giving you an overall map. And then it's, it's my opinions and a lot of borrowed pictures. We'll say, uh, I did not talk to every single person from which I borrowed these pictures, uh, and not all the references are there. So I'm kind of failing my science side, but that was too much work. Uh, so if there are any scientist students in here, uh, it's not a very deep scientific discussion. I'll tease a little bit about what we're doing at Orion. Uh, but really, again, this is a talk to kind of oh, go over my journey from the time I graduated about 15 plus years ago and today. So a lot of times the biggest question is, what is an entrepreneur? Uh, you can put an entrepreneur into Google and you get lots of fun images like these. You get lots of fun word clouds, uh, and you get a lot of tips and tricks at how to make yourself the best entrepreneur. You know, what they don't tell you in school, or what you need to learn in business school, or if you're a scientist, these are the classes you should go take. But, you know, entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur is a lot more than that. There's a lot more that goes into it. And then my personal opinion on an entrepreneur, um, you know, differs even from those definitions. You know, an entrepreneur is not only someone that has gone through and done it before, but it's someone that's done the cycle and then starts to give back. I think giving back, whether it's through education, whether it's through money that you've made, uh, is a really critical point in entrepreneurship. And so I live in Kansas City now, uh, and one of the big entrepreneurs there is a guy named Ewing Kaufman. Uh, so Ewing Kaufman, he started um, a biotech, essentially. Uh, he saw a problem. Uh, it was in one of these drugs uh, that doctors were giving their patients, and it was really expensive. It was hard to do. And he found that if you bought a whole bunch of oyster shells and you crushed up those oyster shells and you put them in a pill, uh, you could sell those to doctors. Uh, and it was osteocal. And so what he did is he bought a bunch of oyster shells. He went into his basement, he crushed them up. He made these pills and he sold them out of the back of his Cadillac. And he started with $10,000. Um, if you make drugs in your basement and sell them out of the back of your car now, uh, that's not really a great process to start a company. It's a great process to get three square a day and free housing. Um, but he saw a problem. Uh, he found a solution for that problem, and it started Marion Labs. Uh, Marion Labs went, went on to become Marion Herx Rossell, uh, Marion Merrill Dow, eventually to Bristol-Myers Squibb. He made a lot of money, enough money to buy the Royals in 1975 or thereabouts, and then also start the Kauffman Foundation of Entrepreneurship. And so he started giving back to the community, not only bringing in stuff that was specific to his business, but also the community as a whole. And so this is a short video uh, that they made to celebrate his uh, 100th birthday. He did not live to be 100, but I think it's important, so it's only two minutes.
you cannot solve the problems of society by throwing money at it. But it sure gives you a wonderful feeling when you do it right and you accomplish something that helps humanity. We need to prepare our youth of today. They are going to be the leaders of the future. So it's absolutely necessary to have good education. Plus, in my judgment, the way to eliminate discrimination and racial discord is education. If you give those kids hope for the future, if you let them know that somebody cares about them, you'll be surprised at what they can achieve. With your high school graduation, you now have the power to choose what you will make of your lives. Choose well. Choose well. We believe that we can pass on some of the philosophies and principles, techniques, leadership tactics that will enable new entrepreneurs to be successful. It's your right to be uncommon if you can. You seek opportunity to compete. You desire to take the calculated risk to dream, to build, yes, even to fail, and to succeed. The greatest satisfaction that I have had is helping others, doing something that either inspires them or aids them so that they'll be not only a better person, but be a better productive citizen of the United States. All of the money in the world cannot solve problems unless we work together. If we work together, there is no problem in the world that can stop us as we seek to develop people to the highest and best potential. So there's, yeah. so there's a couple things I think that resonated really well uh, with what I learned at Gonzaga um, to what Ewing tried to do from his mission. And a lot of it is giving back um, in ways that you think that you can. And so another thing I look at from an entrepreneurship, I mean, this would make a really bad bumper sticker, so they've shortened it to be the change you want to see in the world. Um, but you know, this is Mahatma Gandhi's quote that basically said, you know, you can see a problem and you can fix it by going out and living that, you know, your own solution. As well, Einstein, he said, any intelligent fool, so a nice oxymoron, can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. Um, but it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. So it's really easy to see a problem and try and solve it how everybody else is trying to solve it. But it's really hard to kind of take a step back and avoid kind of the rush that goes on and see how can you actually solve that problem to have the biggest impact. And so while I was at Gonzaga, you know, the, the components of service and I was a science student forced to take English and philosophy and religion classes, you know, at that time, it didn't make as much sense. Um, some professors were better than others, uh, but now, as it sinks in, it made a big difference on how I sit and I shape even what we do today. So I'm gonna give a little my own kind of journey, uh, and then we'll get into some of the, the more fun talks, uh, parts of the talk. So I was born in 1980, um, much longer than most of you were alive, in Pensacola, Florida, so I was a Navy brat. And uh, I said I washed out as a rock star five years later. I uh, just couldn't make it. So I had to go do something else. Um, and that something else was watching Mr. Wizard back in the 90s. I loved the show. I mean, I would run home from school every day so I could watch it because it was before DVRs and YouTube and all the other. And if I missed it, I was sad. I got a chemistry set that actually still had fun chemicals in it. Uh, nowadays, it's a whole bunch of colored salts. Uh, but back then, you could actually combine things that would light on fire. And so as a 12-year-old, uh, you bet that I explored every single reaction that either exploded or lit stuff on fire. Uh, so we did have a small fire outside of our garage. This was not our actual garage. 
Um, and then in high school, I took a lot of AP science classes, as I'm sure most people took AP classes. Um, but my genetics professor that was led by Mr. Baker, he was actually going back to school as a high school teacher to get his PhD at the University of Washington. And so one of the things he did during our genetics class is he borrowed a PCR uh, back in 1998, and we actually did a whole bunch of PCR stuff on salmon. So we went up to a salmon farm, we did some tail clippings, and then we ran PCR, and we did this whole comparison of all these fish that were in the, in the salmon returning that year to look at what generation they were from and what lines they were from. And that was super interesting. So when I went to college here at Gonzaga, I decided I was going to major in engineering and law which didn't really make sense with anything else, but I came to Gonzaga and I said, I'm gonna be an engineer. And so I started my, uh, my freshman year uh, over in the engineering building, and I quickly realized I hate engineering, and I switched to chemistry and biochemistry in 2000. And so the, the first thing was, I think everyone is in a rush to get through as fast as they possibly could. And that decision you know, had a lot of implications, and one of which was that I was going to be at Gonzaga longer than I initially planned. Uh, so I was here for five years, uh, and during that time, um, I got to do research in Jeff Kronk's lab, because um, he had just come on as a new professor. And so we were studying beta-carbonic anhydrase. Uh, we were doing some crystallography of the, the protein. We were trying to produce the protein. We were trying to do some, um, making some mutants of that protein. And so the research that I did there, I got to go uh, present at the Murdoch uh, research symposium for undergraduate research. We went down to Whitman College in Walla Walla. And it was a, a fun trip, and that was my first really experience in being able to take something that I did in the lab and present it to people uh, that kind of cared to ask questions about it and challenge you on it. Uh, and so when I graduated, my main focus was to go to med school. Uh, I had applied to med school, I'd taken the MCATs, I was going on med school interviews, uh, and I was applying to MD-PhD programs. And I had an interview with Ohio State, and one of the people there said, why would you take a perfectly good med school student seat that wants to go out and practice medicine so you can go get a PhD? And, you know, I had, like, my canned answer that you, per you, you know, prepare, but it was really difficult in the sense for me of if that's the attitude I'm going to go into, like, is this what I want to do? And then my med school mentor was also our family doctor, and I was having lunch, and we were talking about this, and I was really jazzed up about my, my Murdoch presentation, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I think you're going to make a horrible doctor, so maybe you should rethink your career path. And, I mean, it kind of hurt, but it was, you know, it rang kind of true, so I said, oh, I'm going to take a gap year. I'm not going to go to med school. Uh, and I went and started working at NASTEC in Seattle. Uh, so again, NASTEC wasn't my first destination. Uh, we were, I was telling this story earlier. So I moved back to Seattle, and I started working at REI. Because I really liked skiing, and I really liked rock climbing. And I could get a lot of discounted stuff there. And so I was working at REI while I was applying for jobs. And it just happened my manager, his wife, worked at NASTEC, and they were hiring for a formulations position. And so it was through those experiences that I ultimately ended up at NASTEC. I really liked it. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was a great learning experience. It paid really well. So my gap year turned into a gap three years. Uh, but I was in a meeting. Uh, we were presenting, getting ready to go into a clinical trial. And one of the leads um, from another department, as we were presenting the data, had asked some questions. And I was the one that designed the experiment, executed the experiments, analyzed the data. And so I was saying, you know, this is what these data are saying. We were, I was actually asking to delay going into the clinic. And she looked at me and she said, well, you don't understand because you don't have a PhD. And my response was not appropriate um, at that time. But I quickly said, fine, I'll go get a PhD. And that's how I ended up in Kansas. So I went to Kansas for my master's and PhD. And there I came on as a self-graduate fellow. I got a second graduate fellowship while I was there. I began working with the Kauffman Foundation. They were sponsors with one of them. Uh, the Institute for Advancing Medical Innovation. I got to be on the cover of a magazine, uh, so that was super cool. And I, instead of graduating and leaving, uh, we filed a couple patents around my, our research. Uh, I did a postdoc to write some papers and investigate starting the company. And then we started Orion in November of 2012. So since then, it's obviously been smooth sailing with no problems, and life has been grand, right? Because that's what entrepreneurship is. 
I don't know. We have many more years and many more bullet points on kind of where we went. Um, I'm not going to fill out all of them, but quickly when you start a company, you realize you need money. And if you're in biotech, you need lots of money. So we applied for grants, and we had our first SBIR grant about two years after we started the company. Uh, so not only do grants take a long time to write, they take a long time to get funded, even after they've been funded. We've raised some angel money. Uh, so those that aren't familiar, angel money are usually high net worth individuals uh, that can write checks of 25000 or above. And so you get a group of them, and you show that your idea is really good. And then they can come in in the early stages and help um, provide some funding. We did a second angel round in 2016. Uh, we applied for more grants. We actually got a two-year, half-million-dollar grant from the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation uh, for our type 1 diabetes program in 2017. And then in 2018, so at the end of last year, we became the first Midwest company south of Chicago to get an investment from Peter Thiel and Breakout Labs. So Breakout Labs' focus is on looking at early-stage companies. And you can see by 2018, we founded the company in 2012. And so that's six years, but we're still an early-stage company uh, doing deep science. And so doing some of those qualifying experience but that really gave us a foothold into San Francisco, talking with some real ventures capitalists and other groups. Uh, and then we have a Series A term sheet that we signed earlier this year. So it's been a, you know, I thought this process would be two to three years from everything that everyone told me. Uh, but once you get into it, it's much longer and it's a lot of work. But from there, we've learned a lot of different things. And so, you know, a nice Gonzaga pun with a few lessons in early entrepreneurship. Um, I brought some swag, so I'm, people know these two guys here. Can anyone tell me who either of those two people are? There you go. Do you like blue or gray? Which one is Einstein on? My right, yeah. Do you like blue or gray? Oh, nice catch. So... Oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's a hair band. That thing won't snap on you. You can give a nice little man bun. Um, so these are all different people that try different ways to solve problems. So obviously Einstein, you're looking at basic versus applied science. This is Henry Ford. So fine versus fix. You know, Zuckerberg, you're really looking at technology versus product. You know, and then Steve Jobs or Ashton Kutcher, whoever, whichever one you want to look at there. But one of the things Henry Ford said was, I invented nothing new. And I think that's important. I invented nothing new. I simply assembled the discoveries of others behind whom centuries of work and progress happens and all the factors they make for it made it inevitable. And really what that means is there is a time and place for each new discovery or product or therapy. Um, and there's reasons behind that. You know, you can't do the AI algorithm building that we do now when the computer was first invented because you need terabytes and pentabytes and all sorts of fast processing speed. I'm not a computer person, so that's about the rest of my words. But the amount of processing power you need to do these complex equations or molecular modeling, molecular simulations that took weeks or months now take hours. You know, these, there's all these different pieces that go into it that contribute to your ability to do what you ultimately want to. You know, Facebook couldn't have been Facebook when we had carrier pigeons, right? So Facebook could only be Facebook because it was a time where the internet was becoming prevalent everywhere and people could get on and communicate and they wanted to make all these different connections. And so it's the same with Orion. We're in autoimmune disease and we do a lot of immunology. And so in immunology, there's a lot of instruments that we use whose capabilities weren't the same that they were five years ago or 10 years ago. And the biggest one that we use, um, there's an instrument that you can look at one cell at a time. So you, you basically put all these samples through, and it goes through this little channel, and you can look at a single cell. And you shine a laser at it, and then it shoots off all these different colors, and those different colors mean different things. 15 years ago, you could look at four colors. And so if you wanted to look at your therapy and then two cell types, you could only change one part of that experiment each time. So you would have to run many, many, many experiments. Many times those experiments need 
animal products. So you have to go through many, many animals, and it becomes very expensive. Now you can look at 32 different colors. So in 15 years, you go from 4 to 32. So experiments become a lot easier to do because you can collect so much more information, which is why you see therapies changing the way you do now, is because all these pieces come together, which makes it inevitable because we can finally understand what's going on. And so the other famous quote of Henry Ford, if you don't know it, he said, if I asked people what they wanted, if I went out and did my market research around what people wanted, they would have said faster horses. They wouldn't have said the Model T. Because it still wasn't as fast as a horse, but you could put four people in it, right? So knowing how those pieces come together and how they can impact moving forward is really important. And then this is another question. Um, you know, in a presentation where there's professors and postdocs and students and other people, you know, how do you balance this? And this is especially true in early kind of um, commercialization and development of ideas. You know, if you're a grad student, you need, this is the number one priority of everything. Can you defend this research and get your PhD and graduate? But a defendable product is, or defendable product is something that's usually sophisticated, usually very specific to what you are looking at. And it becomes very hard to sell to a broad amount of people. So how do you balance these things between where you want to go with your education and how you want to get to the end point of, say, if you want to start a company? And so this is really the, the fantasy versus reality of, you know, all I have to do is come up with a good idea, and then I just go from there to there. But there's a lot of obstacles in the way. Um, but it can be very fun. Uh, this is another fun graph. It seems like everyone that talks about entrepreneurship wants to make fun graphs where you have, you know, you think of an idea, and you get really excited by the idea. Then you go through this trough of disillusionment where you go, man, this idea stinks. And you go back, and you come up with a new idea. Or you go here to the trash heap of failures, because you will fail. You'll fail a lot. But going through this process, hopefully getting to the slope of enlightenment and eventually you know, changing the world and becoming one of these 100 companies. All these 100 companies started with one idea, one concept, one notion. And then the big question is, not only can you sell it, but do people want it? So technology push versus market pull. Is that a bad idea? You know what one of the number one selling products on Amazon is? It's a dog carrier right in the front. So what's the difference between that and that? Maybe it's timing. Maybe it's the amount of money people spend on their pets. Maybe it's the amount of time people want to spend with their pets. What about that one? Do you have any products that come to mind when you think about that? How about those? Are any of those on campus? Thousand bucks a pop? Emergency rooms love them. How about these ones? Right? Think of something that reminds you of this? Have you seen it? Airplane neck pillows. Right? I have two unicorn ones in my house. So this whole idea of push versus pull, what do customers want? What do industry want? So here's Henry Ford and Nikola Tesla. Henry Ford had a problem. I won't go to read through. I'll give you the cliff notes. Had a problem. He calls in Tesla. He says, I have a problem in the factory. Tesla walks over. You know, I'm sure it was longer than this. Puts an X on the wall somewhere. Henry says, give me a bill. And he sends him a bill for $10,000. He says, why is this bill $10,000? Please explain it. He said, well, it's a dollar for me to put the chalk on the wall, and it's $9,999 to know where to put it. So having an idea of how do you solve the problem for the industry is just as important if you can sell it. And then lastly, investors. So every good idea needs money, and how do you get that money from investors? You think of an idea, you start paying out of pocket, find someone that believes in it with you, you guys do it together, and then we call this the friends, family, and fools round. Right? Who believes in you more than anybody else? Your friends and family, right? So they write some checks in here and you get some money. But eventually you need to get to a point where people that can accurately vet the idea, find someone that can believe in it, find someone that can help you. You get to that seed stage, that's that angel round. 
and then it goes on from there. Venture capital, maybe IPO, or if you're selling, in our case, to Merck or Pfizer, is where you get, you know, but every step of this way is more and more expertise, more and more understanding, more and more knowledge of your space. Is that product actually going to work? Is that therapy going to work? Is anyone actually going to pay for it? And the flip side to all of this is how does that, what does that mean for you as the founder? As you go from your left to right, it means you own less and less of that pie. So the gray is the founder part. So you could say the gray is Josh when he came up with Orion in 2012. And then we co-founded it with my advisor. You know, we split the pie. Then we start bringing in employees or other investors. And the pie gets smaller. Then you start getting angel investors and VCs. You bring on more employees. And so that pie gets chopped up more and more. And so not only does that mean you own less, that's the least of the things, but the more and more that you chop up this pie with people that have given you money, the more and more those people are going to expect that they get a return. So your idea or your company or your product or your therapy needs to create more and more value the way that you go across this. And so you can create value a lot of different ways, right? If you can actually sell something, you just get more and more sales. That's a good validation, right? More and more people want it. Uh, in biotech, it's a little different. You have to develop your science um, at a point where people will believe, once you actually start shooting it into people um, in clinical trials, that it's going to work. And so it's different for each industry, but if you can avoid the mistakes that other people have made, don't overvalue what you have. Just because someone will give you $200 million doesn't mean it's worth $200 million. Because as soon as you take that $200 million, the expectations are much higher than if you really only needed 20. The, the famous under-promise, over-perform, you know, if you go and pay $100 for a steak and it comes out bad, or you go and pay $20 for a steak, but all you get is broccoli and a baked potato, but it's fantastic, I think most of the time someone would rather have that $20 steak with less, less fixings. And then you need to be open. As a founder, you always think that you have the best idea and you are the best person to push that idea forward. But many times, especially when you're talking to investors, if you say, well, I am the only one that can do this, guess what they typically say to you? So it's the golden rule. Does anyone know what the golden rule is? No? He who holds the gold makes the rules. So the people with the money will tell you what you need to do, and it's your job to align with that, but also kind of bring in your own perspective. And then it's really easy. Again, Google mistakes founders make, and you get a lot of these graphics where people just say, you know, everything from you have to be in it 100%. You can't be half-hearted. Um, you know, don't raise too much money, but it also has... Don't raise too little money, right? So there's a lot of things out there and a lot of different ideas. But the big takeaway is find someone that's in your space that's doing it or done it and just go ask. Ask questions. Ask lots of questions. Scientists get that. Um, I don't think sometimes business students do. And so that's one thing that I would always do when I go to talk to business students. You know, the, the asking questions isn't necessarily a sign of not knowing. It's a sign of wanting to know more. Uh, it's the same action but a different outcome. And so in a startup timeline, uh, really there's two, tech, two kind of startups we can think of. There's technology, so this would be software, you know, Facebook, Apple. Um, it's a long process. Uh, so you hypothesize, so you think of an idea. And the best way to think of a good idea is to ask people in the space. You know, if you go into a college room and you say, hey, you know, give me 10 ideas out of here, uh, usually you'll get one, like, where's the best happy hour? Uh, usually you'll get one that's kind of surrounding, like, where can I rent X, Y, Z quicker? And you're like, so you want to compete with Yelp and Google or Uber and Lyft or, you know, Tinder and whatever another dating app is? So not thinking kind of through where it goes, but asking, say, hey, I'm really interested in blockchain. Find an alumni through the network that has something in there and say, what would you say the three biggest new, like needs in your area are? Or I'm thinking of, you know, getting into the therapeutic space. What are three big needs that we need to really fill? And then going through this validation, creating a minimum product, and then scaling, however that scaling looks. In the case of technology, it's sales. Um, but you know, it's not this idea saying, a good idea will run the company. It's identifying a problem and then finding something that someone will pay for it. 
And then what I don't think people really realize is each of these areas across the board is connected. And so it's like one of those little crypto graph things where if you turn this product wheel, say, oh, we need to modify this product a little bit, you know, one or two or all of these is going to change. You know, how does that change how you buy that product? How does that change how you make that product? How does it change your investor pitch? Um, how does it change legal and accounting? This is probably the least sexy but most important thing in any startup is legal and accounting. Uh, because if your books aren't straight, if your patents aren't right, um, if your SEC documents aren't right, it can mean everything from you know, causing a banking area to you know, losing that um, proprietary niche that you have to going to jail. So you know, not investing in this, someone's like, oh, I can do my own accounting. I mean, we do our own accounting, but then we have an outside accountant audit it. Oh, we can prepare our own legal stuff. Yeah, we have our own contracts, but then I also have patent lawyers and SEC lawyers and contract lawyers. And that's a lot of money. And you need to factor this stuff into how you do all these different things. And so how these de things develop over time is the same. And even in drug development. So this is what everyone sees, everyone hears. Um, basically, you know, the Forbes article, Developing drugs is hard. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of money. 10 to 15 years and a billion dollars. Why would anyone ever get into this market? Ever. Right? Why doesn't Pfizer and Merck and Johnson & Johnson just run the show all the time? Well, the fact of the matter is biotech is a small portion of this. Ideas always start over here in academia. Academia is the best place to do this basic research because you have to think up these 10,000 to 15,000 different compounds or ideas, if you want to look at it that way. And so they do all their things, whether it's through grants, whether it's through partnerships. And then you get to this portion where you've narrowed it down. You know, Maybe you start really early at 250, or maybe you're at five. And so biotech runs through this three to five, seven years. And then once you get into people, once you show it's safe, big pharma will come in. And there's a reason behind that. You know, Pfizer and Merck and Johnson & Johnson used to have their own R&D departments. But they realized, we're paying $10 billion a year, I'm making this number up. We're paying $10 billion a year to have our own R&D department. And we're trying to run this whole process. You know, but there's no way we can have 100 disease programs with 10,000 molecules each and efficiently run this process to clinical trials. Why don't we take that $10 billion and instead find companies that are up to here and pay each company $500 million? Maybe pay one company two billion. Maybe pay a company a, a billion. And now we know we have a fully baked program, and it actually costs us less money than to run our own R&D departments. And so this is the niche that biotech fills, is we try and screen those, get it to a point we can find a partner, and then hopefully we're more on the two billion side than the 500 million. But I don't think anyone would complain if someone said, here's a check for $500 million. So that's where biotech, and specific to Orion, um, this is really where we sit at the Nexus. So we're a virtual biotech company. We actually don't have any labs. Uh, we don't have our own scientists. We do all our science through collaboration. So we collaborate with about seven universities as well as some research institutes. And um, we're actually starting, looking to start our first collaborations outside the United States and Finland and Sweden um, by the end of this year. But so we give them money, resources. They give us back our science. Uh, we get that money from funding institutions, whether it's venture capitalists, angels, grants, you know, industry partnerships, and then hopefully we get to this point at some point where we have a partnership and we can exit. And so we serve as this node of getting science and money to the point where we can sell it to someone. So now this is really the personal side of the talk of where Orion came from and then kind of where we're going and how we got there. So. The evolution started with my PhD defense. Uh, this is the actual first slide from my defense. And you can see there's lots of very fancy words, um, not so fancy graphics, on a white background with dark letters. So it's a, a very academic talk. Um, I would like to point out that my letters are blue instead of black. But it started here. Uh, Really what I was looking at was optimizing therapies and how do you deliver a therapy to an immune cell, like a T cell or a B cell, in a way that it actually wants to do something with it. So from there, um, I 
took some ad hoc business classes. So business students might recommend, recognize this as a crude business model canvas. And I went through the typical exercises of identifying partnerships and activities and value proposition and tried to fit that into the biotech box. You know, the biggest thing that every business student likes to look at, and especially MBA students when they do this, is revenue. So biotech doesn't sell anything. We, we make science and then we look to partner it, but we don't have a drug. We can't sell a drug. Um, and so revenue is a huge variable in a lot of the equations of how you spend your money other places. So I was in an MBA class and we were presenting Orion as a prospective project and they were running all their numbers on this. And they said, well, what's your revenue? They said, we don't have any revenue. They said, well, we need a revenue number to do your marketing budget, to do your you know, employee allocation, all this other stuff. Where do you get your money? And they say, well, we get our money from licensing, venture capital, investment, grant money. Well, how much money do you think you're going to get? You know, and I said, $10 million. We're going to raise $10 million. They said, OK, we'll use that number. And so they went out and they took $10 million and they crunched it through all this stuff and they said, okay, here's your budget. And we're going through the budget and we got to marketing. And he said, marketing needs to be 20% of this, so your marketing budget is, you know, $200,000. And they said, marketing for what? They're like, well, we just need to have a marketing number. And they said, well, this obviously doesn't work. So we did some other business model canvas to model out the concepts better before we actually started Orion. And then, this was the very first Orion presentation that I ever gave. I went away from the background and you know, gave this presentation. I actually won uh, the business pitch contest with it. But again, a lot of words, a lot of stuff going on. And one of the things we said is like, we need a better logo. You can't design a logo in PowerPoint. And so we went through. So um, I got another question for the audience. We'll see. You know, what do you think the first logo that we chose was? Nope. This one? Yeah. Do you like blue or gray? Blue? Nice catch. So we started. This was our first pitch deck. Um, so we improved the story a little bit. Uh, we focused the scope from autoimmune disease to one called neuromyelitis optica. It actually affects the optic nerve and causes patients to go blind uh, and also causes paralysis. So you can see this was April in 2013. Uh, we got some feedback. And so in November 2013, we kind of changed the look a little more, focused the statement a little bit more, and we got more feedback that said that was a bad logo. So <laughs> in 2014, uh, we shortened the front of the deck even more. Um, so now we don't even say what we do. We're therapies with vision. We have the new logo. And this is what we went out and raised our first money with. Um, but since then, uh, this is our now current pitch deck uh, from, this is the most recent one uh, that we're out raising our Series A. And so from the pitch deck side of things, I'm just going to kind of run you through the first couple slides of how we um, pitch Orion. So we are a pre-IND company uh, developing therapies to treat I, um, autoimmune disease with a once-weekly injection starting in type 1 diabetes. And so what this means is patients, rather than taking daily insulin shots, five, six, seven a day, uh, they can give themselves a shot once a week, and it'll stop their disease. The opportunity exists because we've realized how type 1 diabetes starts, how it progresses, what are identifying factors, starting with genetics all the way to immune activation. But yet we're waiting all the way here till about stage three to start treating. So by stage three, patients have lost over 80% of their beta cells. Typically, they've lost the ability to produce insulin on their own, so they're on daily therapy. So if you try and think of treating a disease where you've already 80% down the road, it's really hard to actually stop and or reverse that patient's disease. The market opportunity earlier has been realized. So there's a company, Prevention Bio, that actually came out and showed that if you treat at stage one and stage two, you can stop the progression of disease. The way they did it was they took out all the patient, patient's T cells. So the patient no longer has T cells. And for those that aren't scientists, T cells are important because they basically keep you healthy. If you don't have T cells, not only can you get sick, they, you know, T cells also mitigate stuff like cancer. So cancer is always present in your body. 
you know, cells will come out and they can be cancerous, but your body can shut them down before they actually become a problem. But if you don't have T cells, all of a sudden it can be a big problem. So imagine you are a two-year-old that has type 1 diabetes and you say, for, for the rest of your life, you'll no longer have T cells. It's not really a, value, like a viable option. And so you need to find ways to treat the disease better. Uh, so I won't get into the deep science here, but there's a correlation between both T cells and B cells in early stage disease. So this is not only important from the science factor, but as I said, that clinical endpoint where partners are interested and how you design those clinical trials, this is really important. Because right now we just wait until people get sick. Or right now we just wait to see if people need insulin. But if you can find markers in early stage disease that can identify not only patients earlier, but success earlier, you can actually change how you treat it. And this goes back to that Henry Ford quote where it's saying, the tools were there finally. So the tools are there finally that we can start changing not only how we develop the therapy, but how we do the clinical trial. And so our answer is what we call soluble antigen arrays, uh, or SAGAs. And so they're designed from both physical and molecular scientific standpoints to treat disease earlier. And again, I won't get into a lot of the science as to why, but when we present to VCs, we go through each of these. You know, We're presenting to immunology PhDs and chemistry PhDs. Why indeed is this better? How does this interact with the cell better? How does it turn it off and stop disease? But you know, this is from the science, what we can display, more about what our product is and what sets our product apart, and then how does it compare to what's already out there? So this is really our product opportunity or differentiation slide. What was tried before with nanoparticles and small peptides you know, how do those differ? Well, these are like vaccines, right? We know that if you deliver something like this, you get a vaccine response. Well, if you're autoimmune, you don't want that. And so going through how you differentiate your product, but then the biggest thing, especially in a disease like type 1 diabetes, is going to be safety. You know, these are kids. People can relate to that. People can relate to pictures of children, right? Over 60% of the new patients are going to be children. So you want to give something to these children that's going to be safe. You don't want to take away their T cells or B cells. And so that's a big factor. Also, what people don't think about is all those other little cogs in the wheel. How does that change your therapeutic design? Can you actually make this stuff? We already know that there's a lot of things people have tried that are very hard to make. Nanoparticles are very hard to make reliably and over and over again. So all of a sudden, manufacturing becomes a very big point in the pitch. And then showing that you can do it over and over again or across diseases. So right now, we actually have five programs that we're trying to get off the ground. Um, we have three in neuromyelitis optica, type 1 diabetes, and multiple sclerosis that are mature. Uh, myasthenia gravis and then pemphigus vulgaris are other ones we're trying to start. But validation, like not only do you have programs, you have validation that other people believe what you're doing is going to work. Um, we've raised about 75% of our money non-dilutively, uh, so we've relied heavily on the expertise of patient advocacy groups, uh, the NIH, um, and groups like Breakout Labs to bring in money to validate the idea to move it forward. And so, um, obviously you need to have your management team. We have five people uh, in the company itself. Uh, and then advisors and support. And so within the deck itself, it's how do you not only build the story to give confidence in the technology, but your ability to execute it? And then how can you relay that kind of in nice, clean message? A lot of this stuff we typically put in the background because uh, people don't like to read. And I can already look at your faces by having all these words on the page. You're no longer paying attention to me. You're trying to read what Larry Steinman at Stanford's doing. And so when you have something that is you have to walk them through. It's much easier than doing something like this, but it's necessary, right? If all I did was say here, you know, this is our team, this is what we're gonna do, and no one else believes in us, you, know, you don't have a lot of credibility there. But um, this is something I put together just for this talk, because uh, I got interested, because I was looking for certain slides, and I was looking for pictures here and there, and I started going through our numbers to date. Uh, so we've sent about a thousand cold call emails. Uh, so these could be emails to investors, these could be emails to funding groups, uh, these could be emails to potential collaborators. Uh, about 500 of those uh, leads to a second email. That's what I classified as a conversation. Um, we have over 400 individual iterations of our presentation. 
Um, so that's updating data, updating graphics, giving something specific for a talk. Like here, I would count the Gonzaga talk as one, uh, presenting at a conference. Um, of those 500 conversations, we've had about 100 follow-up conversations. So I started with a list of about 350 venture investors, uh, and it's down to about 110. And those are all ones that have emailed me back in some way or form and said, yes, Orion's interesting too early. Um, Orion could be interesting at this point. We're raising a new fund in 2020. Um, we're not really in this space right now, but I want to learn more. Or hopefully we get to the point where they say, yes, let's have a bigger conversation. Um, in addition to the 400 PowerPoint presentations, I have about 50 executive summaries, which are our one-pagers, and then business plans, which is much bigger. And then we've written about 30 grants. I always said I would never wanted to get into academia because I didn't want to write grants, and that was truly false. Um, we've moved about 15 investors into diligence, so this is getting them into a confidential uh, agreement we show them everything from scientific stuff to our SEC documents to employment agreements. Um, we've moved uh, five therapeutic pipelines forward. They said we re made about $2 million in funding. And all of this has given us one Series A term sheet from one investor. So we started with 1,000 of them uh, nondescriptly, and we've narrowed them down to one. And now we're trying to get two or three more to jump on board. So as I started the talk, one of the big things in entrepreneurship, as I said, is not only getting to the point where you can make money, but then putting that money to work in other ways outside of business. So while Ewing Kaufman is one that I consider a true entrepreneur, I think Bill Gates is as well. And he said, as we look ahead into the next century, leaders will be those who empower others. So you know, Bill Gates was the number one richest man in the world for the longest time, and he slipped to number four, I think, this year because he's given $35 billion of his own money away through Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You know, and Bill and Melinda Gates does a lot of different things, you know, looking at third world therapeutic development, helping different programs. Um, but that element of giving back, I think, is just as important. And so we're trying to do the same thing uh, in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, through a program we call Launch Lawrence. So I sit on the board of Launch Lawrence, uh, and it is a nonprofit ecosystem accelerator. And all that means is we're trying to solve this problem. So Lawrence ranks last in America in providing enough jobs for the people that live there, especially the college graduates. So Lawrence sits about equidistance from Topeka, which is the state capital, and then Kansas City, both Kansas and Missouri. So a lot of people will live in Lawrence, but work elsewhere. And then one of the things that you, that been said through the Kauffman Foundation is startups, especially tech startups, can actually develop the jobs needed, not only high growth jobs, but high wage jobs, uh, to really grow communities as a whole. And so we see this, what we call brain drain, uh, from the Kansas City area where people graduate, they go to these bigger cities or bigger um, entrepreneurship hubs, and it's because we don't create these jobs. Our talent leaves. When the good talent leaves, you can pay bad talent a lot less, and they're still happy. And there's also a lot of people that are there that say, I never want to leave, so I'll take whatever job I can get. And so some people say, well, we have enough people to provide for all the jobs, but the question is, do we have enough good people, do we have enough high quality talent, and how can we keep that here? And so by trying to create this network, um, we're really limiting this amount of time where we can go into KU, um, connect into our alumni network, and say, what are the needs in your industry that you see need to be fixed? Give those ideas to students that have lots of energy and time, and then accelerate this to a point where they can be five, six, ten people companies. So this is our board. Uh, this is why we think it'll work in Lawrence. It's kind of funny, the KU campus sits on top of a hill, uh, but there's very many buildings uh, that look like Gonzaga. And when I decided to go to KU for my graduate work, my friends, such as Matt here, joked that I only choose my colleges based on their basketball programs. So um, KU's won a couple more championships than Gonzaga. I'd like to see that change. but. I think it's really important from the community standpoint where it extends beyond the classroom. You know, the buy-in goes throughout the whole university uh, and being able to provide for that. So what I've learned, the big takeaway lessons that you guys can have, um, it is hard work and it's not for everyone. 
know, there's a lot of times when I sit down and have a coffee with some of the things they would, you know, say, I want to start a company or I want to look at this beyond saying don't do it and seeing if they come back. Um, I ask other questions beyond, you know, what's your idea? You know, how have you validated the idea? Because everyone has that on the tip of their tongue. Oh, we've raised $20 million in NIH funding over the lifetime of this research. And, you know, this partnership says if we do this, then I say, you know, are you single? Are you dating someone? Do you want to marry them? Are you married? Like, well, how's that important? You know, I've seen people that are in a relationship or married, and then it gets to the point where the partner says, it's either the company or me. And it's about a 60-40 division about what they choose. So, I mean, it is a very important factor where you sit there and, you know, it's your baby. You put a lot of time, effort, and tears into it. And this graph is tiny, but it's the day in the life of the entrepreneur, and you can see it's up and down. And the biggest goal is to try and get those ups down and those downs up so you're not completely manic by the end of every day. And it's definitely not a stable career path. Um, it's stressful and lonely, uh, but that doesn't mean it's a one-man show. So I say it's a team effort. This is my family. I have four kids. Um, we're out in the sunflower fields uh, in Kansas. But you need to have this fine balance between what you're trying to do and what's important in your life. Um, I have one colleague. Uh, he made the choice of the company uh, over his spouse. Uh, and he invests hundreds of hours a week. And they went public two years ago. So I mean, by any means, that's a successful endpoint. Um, there's people that have chosen their family. Um, for, for all their own reasons. And it's this pathway where you need to go into it and you need to have this open mind and know that you know, there's weeks that you're going to work 100-hour weeks or 120-hour weeks. Maybe you won't sleep. Uh, there's times where I'm in Boston. I fly home. I empty my suitcase into the, the washer. I wash my clothes. I pack it back up. I go get three hours of sleep, and then I go head to San Francisco. And so you're gone for two weeks, and you, know, you see your family for a day. Um, but when you're home, try and be home. Um, and then it's fun, but also not fun. I found this quote from Amy Poehler. Uh, I, I think she's great. But it says, no one looks stupid when they're having fun. You know? You're, you're having a great time. Everyone thinks it's great. But when you come home with mud on your face, you know, that's when you kind of look stupid to everybody else. But if there's a good reason, maybe it's not. So it's, it's, a, it's a, been a lot. It's... I've learned a lot. I still have a lot to learn. And I just want to give back um, as much as I can. And so one of my favorite philosophers is Walt Disney. And maybe it's because I have four kids and I watch a lot of Disney movies. But one of Walt Disney's favorite things, he says, around here, we don't look backwards very long. So you learn from your mistakes, but you keep moving forward, opening up new doors, and doing new things because we're curious. And curiosity keeps leading us down new paths. And so it's this concept of you don't need to have your end goal always in mind. You don't need to be like, well, I was three years old, and I want to be a pediatric brain surgeon. I've had a very kind of windy path, and I had kind of where I wanted to go in mind. But when I went to Kansas, my goal was to be there as short as possible, because I'd never been to Kansas, and I never wanted to live in Kansas. But I wanted a PhD, and they had the number two program in the country. And then I was going to leave, and I was going to go get the job somewhere else. And now I've been there 13 years. Uh, we started Orion, and I'll probably be there for 13 more. Um, but being open to those new ideas and seeing kind of where those directions lead you, I think is really important, especially in this idea of uh, kind of entrepreneurship. So that's my talk. I went about two minutes over. And so um, I know there's some time to talk later, or if there's questions, uh, we can go through those. Uh, but thank you.